Kia ora and welcome to another episode of Rural New Zealand. I'm your host Scotty Banford, join me as we check out what's happening in the Canterbury region. Alrighty, on this week's episode, I get dragged into the wool shed and get made to work hard for a change. For farmers who are out there thinking about planting fodder beet this spring, we have all the information for you. But first we're off to a small scale goat farm on the banks of the Hurunu River. So Matthew, we're here in Hurunui. What led you to buying goats for your farm? Uh, probably about 20 years ago, um, I uh, used to troll the bison exchange for goats and go around and pick up all the old goats that no one else wanted, usually sanins, uh, and then cross them with a, um, a boer buck, which I got off the, um, the government, because they were the only people bring them in those days. Um, and then my, my intention was to breed a goat that was the same size as a calf, that was my idea. Um, and then uh, that all fell, fell away because my mother's, I had them at my mother's place who eventually sold them all. So then I started buying, getting into the lures. So years ago, this must have been all covered in broom and stuff? Uh, majority of it, Scott. Um, We've had a bit, we've done a bit of clearing, but that was before we had the goats here. Um, yeah, we've slashed and burnt the stuff here, but as you can see, the, um, the goats are certainly keeping on top of the, on the broom. They're almost um, harvested, yeah. which is funny <laughs> enough. Yeah. So up here is a good example of what most of the farm will look like? Yeah, when we, when we, bought, it, when we bought the property, you couldn't even walk through this broom. Uh, it was so thick. Um, as I said before, with the with the cows, the combination of the cows and the goats, the cows will push their way through, um, make a path. The goats come in, and um, it's quite interesting that when the brooms in flower, the goats will go in and pick the flowers off the broom, um, and then shortly after that, there must be a sap flow in the broom, uh, and then the goats will go around and bring bark. The, 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 the mature broom, as you can see through here, they've, it's opened it up and also it's killing the broom off. So yeah. it's actually quite a good um, control of it. Well, the goats will eat anything really. Yeah. They're a browsy animal, so as long as you don't push them, they're quite happy. Is there any issues with trying to keep them in the paddocks and stuff like that? Um, we used to have a few issues, mainly because when we bought the place, um, the, the boundary fences probably went up to scratch for goats. But um, with the um, installation of electrics and netting, um, it certainly keeps contained. But any goat that gets out, uh, we've, we've actually worked out they're a bit lead deficient. So we give them a wee injection of lead and that, that sorts them out. <laughs> and a few of them, uh, the lucky ones, get a, a nice necklace around their neck. Yeah, we had, we had, <laughs> we had an issue a wee while ago of a few getting out and they're, they're swines of things of having one leader and they'll follow the leader and we didn't want the, the older girls to um, teach the younger kids the bad habits, so we, um, we gave the lucky ones uh, the odd collar, as you can tell by um, the ones here in front of us. You must hand rear them yourselves because they're awfully friendly. Um, we don't, we just, they, they, if you look after them, the same as any stock, if you look after them, they, they're very friendly, but we don't dog them. There, there are no, there's no dogs, even though we've got a, probably a, a, a little toy dog here. Um, but I don't come on a scruff, but a dog. Um, they come to the bucket, um, and we, what we do is we try and keep, we try and hand rear one goat a year, sort of like a Judas goat, so that, that those goats will actually be free and they'll come to, come to us, which will, which will drag the whole, all the rest with them. At the moment, we're running 50 goats on 50 acres, um, 58 goats on 50 acres. There's a combination of weathers and does there. It all depends on the, the, um, the amount of food. This year we're running into a, coming out of a drought or and still in a drought, so we're cutting our numbers right back. We had we were, we were running 50, 80 goats and five cows. We got all the cows and trimmed our numbers back to the, the 58 goats. Um, they last year they um, produced 200% 200% kidding, but this year we we got rid of the billy um, and we're just we're not not kidding this year because of the drought. Yeah, how has the drought affected things here? Surprisingly, other than destocking, because we were the, the cows are the biggest, the, the biggest um, 
the biggest thing we got rid of uh, because with, with, if they were still here, they'd be eating most of the tucker, whereas got rid of those, trimmed the n numbers of goats back, and they, because they were a browsing animal, not a, um, a grazing animal as such, um, and because they've got the run of the 50 acres here, they can nibble on, they can browse the weeds. Um, funnily enough, they don't like the clover very much, so they'll leave the clover alone. Um, and they, they're not a, a tight grazer, so they'll leave a certain amount of um, material on the ground so that they don't eat it right out. Yeah. The majority we sell, because we've only got um, probably 50 breeding does, and usually half of those are withers, um, we have no trouble um, getting rid of those through family and friends, and um, sometimes we, we allow a local with a sheep farmers to have a few, just to get them, let them have the delicacy of goat, yeah, yeah. Um, which they really appreciate. And what have the locals thought about your growing goats? Um, I think most of the locals know we're here, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't get any negative responses, a, a bit of, um, bit of jibing and stuff like that, but no, it's fine, like, it, it's this, this land here, which is the, the Hiranui Hills, is perfectly suited to the goats, um, mainly because we don't have any sheep, um, goats and sheep don't go well together, but goats and cows do, cattle go, yeah. um, so it's it's a perfect match for what we've got here. Very low, very low maintenance. There's no shearing, of course, um, and because that's such hard country, we're going to have any feet problems. Um, worms aren't a problem either. Uh, we went to a seminar put on by the Breeders Association, and they uh, said there have been studies done on tannins and willow. And so what we, last year I experimented by giving the goats willow for the tannins to get rid of the worms. And that seems to have worked. Hasn't got rid of probably hasn't got rid of 100 percent of them, but it certainly kept them under control. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's 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 it, the goats are well matched to the property we've got here. Yeah, yeah. and they get some uh, astounding views as well. Oh yes, it's superb, and they probably they probably thrive on the views, Scott, <laughs> as we all do. Oh, exactly. I mean, I'd be a happy goat if I was here. So, yeah. <laughs>so Matthew you spend all this time farming them but then you get the business in yes um, we uh, the only goats I kill in the place are for our own use or for family um, but this the goat here was last year's kid um, so it's coming up probably 10 months old um, it was it was um, 30 kilos standing and it's dressed out to be at 16 kilos um, probably misconception of most goat is that it's a really lean meat with no fat on it, but as you can see in here, there is a considerable amount of um, fat, um, still lean, but um, it's, a good, it's a good carcass. The disappointing thing to me is that when people um, curry it or uh, spice it up, it's a far nicer meat to just have plain, and it, it deserves to be eaten as, as just meat as you would a lamb. And the test to me is when we have um, farmers here for tea, and I don't tell them what they're going to have and we dish up goat, they're surprised more than anything. And where do you sort of see the, the meat industry going for goats? Um, the industry's dependent on numbers. Um, there's certainly the demand there, but it's, it's a matter of um, more farmers farming goats to get the market to go. So it's a, basically it's a supply and demand thing. Once you've got over the, um, the thought of eating goat, um, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know of any other meat, and it's lean. Um, there is there is some statistic that there are more people in the world eat goat meat than they do eat any other meat. So. That goat you saw there ended up in here. And Matthew was right, it did taste amazing. Now stay tuned on Rural New Zealand because after the break we give you all the information you need about fodder beet. Welcome back to Rural New Zealand. Now lately I've been doing a little bit of research and I've found out all the facts and figures you need to know about planting your fodder beet crop. Fodder beet is potentially the highest yielding winter forage options available for farmers currently. 
Some of the advantages of growing photobeet include high dry matter yield, not in the brassica family, therefore not susceptible to brassica disease and pest problems, ease of feeding, low nitrogen requirements, photobeet is high in energy, palatability and digestibility. However, unless care and attention is paid within the first eight weeks from planting, it can lead to a poor experience for growers. Before you plant the crop, there are some points to consider. You should choose suitable paddocks to grow fodder beet that should have light to medium free draining soils and a pH greater than 6. Paddock selection should occur very early in the planning and the first step should be to get a soil test done. Soil pH is crucial to the success of your paddock and can take some time to correct, usually 12 to 18 months in some cases. If your paddock is low in pH, consideration should be given not to sow the paddock into fodder beet. Fodder beet is not a candidate for direct drilling and to help you ensure a good strike for both fodder beet and weed seeds so you can kill them, you need to deep plough and work the paddock until you get a very firm and fine seed bed. Recommendations are that you should select paddocks that are coming out of grass. However, fodder beet can be grown after a wide range of crops, including brassicas. However, fodder beet is very susceptible to chemical residues, particularly those found after a brassica crop. Also, coming out of a cropping program will normally increase weed content that may create issues in the future. Once fodder beet is past the early establishment phase, it is very water economic and high yields have been achieved without the use of irrigation. However, as for all plants, irrigation is desirable. Irrigation has little benefit once the bulbs have fully developed. Fodder beet is sensitive to the effects of residue in the soil from many commonly used agricultural chemicals. The paddock spray history over the last 12 to 15 months needs to be considered. If you aren't sure, you should seek the right advice from your agricultural chemical advisor. The best time to drill fodder beet is between late September in the warmer climates through to November. Soil temperatures of 5 degrees or less are fine, however ensure these ground temperatures are rising and not fluctuating up and down. Early drilling on light soil types is best as the fodder beet seed can require 50 mils of rain or irrigation to strike. Delay drilling if you're going through heavy periods of frost. Fodder beet needs to be drilled at less than 4 km an hour with a precision drill at a depth of 2 to 3 cm. To achieve the desired 60 to 70,000 plants per hectare, you would need to sow approximately 80,000 plants per hectare. A 50 cm row width and a 15 to 20 cm plant spacings are ideal for fodder beet. Given the potential high yield from the fodder beet, fertilizer requirements at the establishment of the seed are very high. The amount of fertilizer used will depend on your soil results and fine tuning of your requirements should be done in consultation with your local fertiliser representative. Fodder beet is also responsive to N, P, K and S, but has special requirements for magnesium, boron and sodium. Levels of magnesium and boron will be determined by your soil test results. Like all members of the beet family, sodium is very important. Typically at drilling, sodium recommendations of 150 to 200 kgs per hectare should be applied. 100 to 150 kgs of agricultural salt should also be added. Nitrogen can be applied four to six weeks after drilling until the bulbs have developed. As fodder beet is slow to gain a canopy, early weed control is an essential element to the successful establishment of your fodder beet crop. Spraying for weeds and to a lesser extent pests will occur regularly for the first eight to 10 weeks after drilling. Fodder beet is only suitable as part of your winter grazing feed plan. A typical ration when feeding fodder beet is 50 to 60% fodder beet, 30 to 35% grass silage, with a balance of diet of hay and straw. It is therefore similar to grazing brassica crops. A daily limit of 4 to 5 kg dry matter per adult cow is recommended. Fodder beet is best grazed between May and August. Like most brassica crops, stock should be slowly introduced to fodder beet during the rumen adjustment period, typically 7 to 10 days. Fodder beet is better when strip grazed using wide and narrow faces. This will allow less damage to the fodder beet and allow stock room to graze peacefully. Always ensure stock have access to fresh and clean water while grazing fodder beet. Early grazing of immature fodder beet can lead to nitrate poisoning, also a potential issue from brassica crops. But for best results on your farm, talk to your seed, spray and fertiliser technicians to get the maximum out of your fodder beet crop.
We spoke to Daryl about what he loves about Fodderbeet on his Colburn farm. Well, for us, it saves us making silage. It, you know, rather make grass silage a bit off to grow 25 or like this one, 30 odd tonne per hectare, and we feed it out in the autumn. Uh, the cows milk on in the last part of the season. Then, as with this stuff, we lift it and we feed out a set of silage in the spring. And it just takes such a such a small area to grow so much. It just works in well with our, um, we do 32 hectares a year on a 250 hectare platform. So it works on a 10 or 12 year, um, 10 or 12 year rotation for new grass. It's just, it just fits all the bills. There's still a few issues with, you know, not burning cows and that, but that's a man-made problem, not a, um, not, not the fodder beats fault. Um, yeah, cost efficiently, it's, it's grown quite cheap compared to growing. You take silage, if you paddock, took a paddock of grass, mowed it four times a year at three tonnes, 12 tonne, well we're going to grab 30 tonne off this in the same area and come back with a very fertile paddock at the end of it. Think about growing more for the future or what's that? Well we done, started off like everyone, we did six hectares the first year, then 10, then 16, then 32, then 32, and next year it's going to be 40. Yeah, yeah. They will, we'll do um, eight hectares on dry land on the hill next year, just to try that. Um, once again if we can get uh, even 15, 18 tonne on that, even if we got 12 tonne, it's still better than the 5 tonne of grass we're going to grow there to start with. Um, yeah, once again it'll give us that sort of bulk to run the R1s through the, through the first winter. Because all the lime and fertiliser you put on, when you come back, she's brand new. Um, this paddock's got a fair bit of docks in it unfortunately, so we'll probably uh, just put straight grass seed in here and then come back and whether it be a 2,4-D or whatever else and clean all them up and then come back and put some legumes in afterwards. Now hopefully that included some great information for you at home. For the best advice on your photobit crop, talk to the experts. Now stay tuned because after the break on rural New Zealand, I managed to sneak into the wool shed and do a side of shearing. Welcome back to rural New Zealand. Now in my days on this fine earth I haven't spent many of them in a wool shed, but I was lucky enough to see the old with the new, the blades with the machine. The humble old wool shed. To some people it's a place to fully neglect have farmers meetings and the old raging party. But for a short time of the year it becomes a hive of activity and is used for one thing, as the name suggests, shearing. The man on the machine was Ben Smith, a local shearer from the North Canterbury area. On the other end of the scale was Richard Watson, a man who enjoys the quiet sound of steel upon wool with his blade shears. The wool shed is also a place I've spent many years of my life trying to avoid. But when the phone call comes, I'm more than happy to attempt to help out. With a twisted arm. After the farmer asked me nicely, he sent me straight out to the back to help out penning up. Now thanks to clever editing techniques, I can now make myself look like the best penner upper to ever grace the wool shed. And here's me making a complete fool of myself. The last thing any shearer wants to do at the end of the day is sit down and have a chat to me. But I managed to twist Ben's arm and we had a wee yarn. So Ben, how long have you been shearing for, man? Uh, about 10 years now, Scott. Yeah. You still love it? Yeah, no, it's all good. Is there a bit of a, I was watching you before and there must be a bit of an act to it, is it? Yeah, there's a bit, but it's nothing too major. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how many sheep do you reckon you shear on average sort of day? Uh, probably about 250 most days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you had an early start this morning, didn't you? Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's well, it's six o'clock now, and I think you started at seven, so there wouldn't be too many jobs that say, uh, and that's an early knockoff, really, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. Wouldn't be too many jobs in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that uh, work those kind of hours and backbreaking work. No, not too many. <laughs> so, how much time sort of goes into preparing your gear? Um, probably about half an hour in the morning, or most people do it at night if they're not too lazy. Yeah. And then. 
Oh, you do a bit during the day, I suppose, some people. Yeah. And you sort of buy your own gear, is it? Yeah, yeah, just buy your own gear and buy what you want, really. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's different. And it must be a cool feeling, sort of working as a team, smashing out you know, a thousand sheep a day and stuff like that. You yeah, know, usually it's a good environment, eh? Pretty, pretty good. Most people are happy. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever thought about sort of going overseas or anything like that? Yeah, I've been over here a couple of times. Pretty good. Yeah. Bit of money. Whereabouts did you go? Uh, just Australia and England. Yeah. And how did the sheep sort of compare to our? Yeah, Australians pretty merinos everywhere. Yeah, yeah. In England, they're pretty good shearing. Yeah. No wool. A bit of a competition going on the wool shed today. Uh, Richard had the uh, the blade shears and you're on the machine. What do you prefer? Well, I can't use the blades, so I can only use the machines. But it's a bit of an art doing the blades, I think. But yeah, the machine usually takes the cake. <laughs> After all my hard work on the back pens, I knew it was my time to help out on the table or even use the wool press. But like any good farmer, his response was a good one. Ah, uh, yeah, like most jobs, Scotty, you've, uh, you've got to do the hard yards and prove yourself. Right now, you're lucky to be even allowed in the wool shed, mate. And uh, you saw me out back penning up. How do you reckon I'd make it in the, in the shearing world? Yeah, you probably wouldn't make it, eh? <laughs> <laughs> what, just not quick enough or just useless techniques? Or? Just... Just not, not up to it. Yeah. Now Richard learned to shear what some people would call the old slow way. So uh, I saw you up there and you, you didn't have the machine, you had the blades. What's the story behind that? Um, well, I started in my 20s, um, did machines and then uh, carried on doing blades after about four years of machines. I preferred the, preferred the blades over the machine, so I've done it ever since. Yeah. Why do you prefer the blades over the machine? Just a lot quieter. Seems to be a lot easier on the animal too, the animal doesn't kick as much, yeah. so it seems to be a, a slightly easier job. Some, some people probably think it's a harder job, Yeah, yeah. Um, squeeze, squeezing your hand all day, but let's see, I think when the animal's not kicking as much, it uh, makes the job a bit easier. And uh, those set of blades that you actually were using, I believe uh, you may have created them yourself. I did, here are the Watson Moldy Shears. Yeah, yeah. Yes. How did yeah. that all start out? Well, just frustration with the old shears, many, many years ago. Yeah. Yes, so we're, we're currently on the market with a, a dagging crutching pair and in the process of developing professional ones at the moment. Yeah. So is that a lot better for your hands and stuff and not as tiring as the old ones? Um, yeah, they're a bit more comfortable. Um, the dagging ones, are, 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 uh, of course, they're, they're, they're lined up you know, for the um, dagging and crutching market. You, you can still share with them, yeah. but they're a bit they're more bulkier, yeah. you know, just for the a bit more robust than the older shears, which are a bit prone to, yeah. if you drop them, you can the, the set can go off and be rather a bit of a pain in the bum, bum for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. You haven't thought about picking up a handpiece or anything silly like that? I did yesterday. Oh. I did one. Yeah, and not, you know, you still thought, don't enjoy it. And I thought to myself, why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to get my blades picked up. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was watching you up there and it's definitely a uh, bit of an art to it. Mm. Yep. How do, you, how do you learn that? Is it just, just... Well, we actually, we, we learnt from the old wool bull. They have um, shearing courses. Um, and back in those days, there was quite a, quite a group of us young fellas who were yeah. together learning to shear, so there were not many of them still shearing today, though. Yeah. There's one, one or two here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And is there sort of demand all over the world? Like, have you travelled a bit with them? No, or? I haven't actually, not with blades. Yeah. No, just, just New Zealand. But there, there is, um, there seems to be a growing um, popularity in the States and places like that for blades again. Mm -hmm. um, and there's always been blade shearing in the likes of South America and, and China, shearing yaks and yeah. South America's llamas and so forth. And, yeah. I think there's even goats, a lot of goats in China as well. Yeah. That are done with blades. Oh well. Mm. Yeah. So I think there's always going to be a there's always going to be a, a market there for you know for not only blade shears but the, the actual art itself will always sort of keep going. Yeah, yeah. And not, not not so much in New Zealand. I think it sort of seems to be you know sort of a dwindling thing in New Zealand. But yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's time to have a few cold brewskis, of which I didn't earn any. And for the lucky sum, watch the sunset and do it all again tomorrow. Well, thanks for joining us this week on Rural New Zealand. I certainly hope you enjoyed the show. Just remember to give us a like on Facebook, and if you have missed an episode, you can watch it on demand. Join us next week as we brave the cold conditions and jump on a plane and visit the Carfields Livestock Team up in Fielding. See you guys then.